sure it's not too stringent with uh, how we're teaching through this. We don't have to be in too big of a hurry, but if everybody could find their spot. We'll go ahead and try to get started. All right, we've been uh, studying first principles here for a couple of weeks, and we're going to continue along that line and of doing that, and, and uh, it's been a enjoyable study for me so far to study out and prepare, and I appreciate your kind comments and your encouragement. That's always helpful. Uh, you guys have been really nice, really nice in your comments, so I very much appreciate that. So like I said the other day when we were winding down in our first principles class, you know, we looked at some things that we had to have determined at the beginning for us to go through this class, and we've done that, and, and then I said the next tough topic that we would uh, dive off into is Jesus Christ. I mean, how do you have a first principles class without that? Without Jesus, there are no first principles. There's no point. And if you get to looking at how to put a lesson together that we're going to talk about Jesus, I mean, how do you, how do you narrow that down? So it's a little bit of a highlights reel, I guess, is what we're going to look at. Uh, the whole Bible is written about Him. There was over 300 prophecies about Him leading up to His being here. And then uh, the whole New Testament is about Him having came and been with us and and died on the cross, and then the whole structure of the church, it's all about Him. The whole, the whole 66 books is about Him. So we could spend a long time talking about Him. So I thought about how to go about this. So the way that I'm going to go about this to begin to start this discussion is maybe going to be a little different than what you would think. You know, we talked about this. My brain works a little different. Today's going to be probably an example of that. So I hope you enjoy the class with what we've decided to look at. Uh, first principles, obviously, is what we're talking about. And then I put this picture up. How many of you seen this one? It's the Last Supper, of course. A lot of us grandparents had it hanging up. It was painted by Leonardo da Vinci. It's probably one of the more famous and most easily recognizable paintings of our Lord that you'll see. Uh, incidentally, from studying uh, the lesson that I did back when we were in the JNS building, we were talking about the events leading up to Christ's crucifixion and the Last Supper, I discovered that this painting is most likely inaccurate with the way they have it set because he's painted them so that everyone is facing us, the viewer that's looking at the painting. Typically, whenever they would have had a meal like this, and I'm, I'm not you know, digging on it or beating on it or throwing shade, whatever you say, uh, just having you to think about what you see and what's presented to you is accurate. There's nothing wrong with this painting, and it's a good depiction of it, and it makes us think, and we can see everybody spread out there but it, it's probably not accurate because the way they would have normally done this is there would have been more round tables all gathered together in a spot. And I said at that time, I said it would be similar like going to El Tap or one of the Mexican restaurants where they set the tables out and they set the dip in the center where everybody can reach the dip and they would have broke bread and they would have reached the dip. And if you read through that account, it makes sense how there could have been conversations that were had between like Jesus and Judas, for instance, that the rest of them probably did not hear. It's because it wasn't really arranged like this, because you can imagine if Jesus was talking to someone down the table, it would have had to have been a loud conversation, and everyone would hear. So, starting this study out, I want to look at a few more paintings. This is the earliest, one of the earliest known paintings that we have of Christ depicted with a beard. This was found in 4th century B.C., uh, 4th century, and the artist is unknown on this particular painting. This painting here next to it is 6th century. It's where it was found. Also, the artist is unknown. So you can see a difference in how they painted our Lord or how they depicted Him. There are some differences, and in, and in some cases there's not differences. You look at Him and how they have Him depicted. He's got the long hair and the beard. His hair is more pulled back in the one in 6th century. It's more refined looking painting. Uh, I have to think that the canvas and the type of material that they would have put the painting on would have probably gotten to be better by the 6th century than it was in the 4th century. So that could have had something to do with it, and then the depiction of him is, is smoother. It's, it's uh, a totally different painting, 4th century to 6th century. This one is the most reproduced image of our Lord and Savior. Uh, it was produced in 1940 by a guy named Warner Solomon. Why would you assume or why would you think that this would be the most reproduced painting of our Lord? Marketing. Marketing. It was done in 1940, which, you know, 4th century, 6th century, 
They didn't really have a way to market these paintings. And of course, the ones in the 4th and 6th century wasn't found until later, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But this one being produced in 1940 by a guy named Warner Solomon. Uh, he was a former commercial artist who created art for advertising campaigns, and he successfully marketed this picture worldwide. Incidentally, he died in 1968. Pretty easy to remember that being my birth year. But through Solomon's partnership with two publishing companies, one Protestant and one Catholic, this is called the Head of Christ. It's commonly known commercially as the Head of Christ as far as the painting. And through these two marketing campaigns, through these two entities, uh, this image was put on everything from prayer cards, stained glass, faux oil paintings, calendars, hymnals in pages of some productions of the Bible, and the best for last, night lights. You know, whenever I saw they put it on night lights, you know, it gave me a chuckle and I thought about a few things and any joke about that seems inappropriate because it's the fact that it's supposed to be an image of our Lord that's put on that, but night lights. You know, and maybe some of you had one, I don't know. But I can remember looking through different hymnals as a youth growing up in uh, the denominations that I intended, that I went to, I remember seeing this painting in it, and it was kind of scattered around all over. So it's something that we saw frequently, this particular painting. Now I'm going to put up a couple of pictures here next of paintings that depict our Lord, and I'm going to ask you some questions, and I don't necessarily want you to answer out loud, but if you want to answer out loud, it's perfectly fine to do that. But whenever I put these up, then I'm going to give you some explanation. I'm going to explain to you why. If you were the type of person that liked to hang paintings in your house of a depiction of our Lord, would you hang this painting as our Lord depicted as an Oriental individual? Or would you not? And ask yourself why. Why would you hang it? Why would you not hang it in your house? What about this one? A depiction of our Lord as a black man. Would you or would you not hang this in your house? So here's where I'm going with this. You see these three different paintings, and it's got the one that was done in the, in the 50s that were heavily marketed, and there's a reason why it was marketed so heavily. And incidentally, if you get to look, and I could have just kept going with more pictures and more pictures, and I'll explain that here in a minute. If you look at the painting of Solomon on the right, the painting that he did, uh, and he did this and he marketed it through this partnership. And if that would have been one that you would have chosen, there may have been a reason. So the, the last part of the description of this painting is what I left off earlier, but this is a description. If you look this up online, this is a description I'll give you. Where I'm going with this is this. Listen to this description. Solomon's painting accumulates a long tradition of white Europeans creating and distributing pictures of Christ made in their image. See the problem with that? So these artists are depicting these paintings and they're making these paintings in their image. There's obviously not a lot of thought, I guess, that would go into depicting our Lord as accurately as they possibly could. They're trying to make this image that they're trying to paint to distribute of our Lord in an image that they can envision Him in. Why do you think that would be? May I start to say something in the back? There's a bias. We want to see things the way that we want to see them sometimes. Mm -hmm. Don, I think Don had something. We're going to talk about that here coming up. That's another, that's another thought. So you guys are hitting right on what I had down here. We try to, people tend to, to create these images of Jesus in a way that they can relate to Him in some way. It makes Him more relatable that 
they're trying to carry the message of Christ and they depict Him in a way that, that they feel like He's more relatable. Uh, the truth is that they don't give a lot of thought to the ethnicity of Jesus in the place that He was born and raised, where He did His ministry, where He wound up dying at. And they, they tend to make Him fit their mold, just like the description. I don't know if they realized what they said when they said this in a description about Whitman's painting is Europeans creating and distributing pictures of Christ made in their own image. Our Lord, when He came to this earth, wasn't made in our image. We were made in His image when we were created. We were made in God's image for a reason. And like I said earlier, I could have kept going with these different pictures. If you want to Google it, you can find them all. There's German, German Jesus, Russian Jesus, Austrian Jesus, Polish. You can just keep going. All the different uh, nationalities. And I don't know if we really realize that we do that. So... The point of me wanting to put this up here and talk about this, we're going to start out initially with the physical Jesus. And I think it's important that we understand if we look at the physical Jesus, it helps us understand more of what, of what He went through and what He endured. It makes Him more relatable looking at Him from a physical standpoint, but we've got to understand these paintings created of Him are not, are not accurate. Um, this is the part of the world that He was in that he spent his time and right in there where that blue circle is and I know you can't really read this from your seat but the reason I put this up there and, I, and I'm okay that you can't read it I wanted to use the world map to give you a concept of where this is where this blue circle is in relation to everything in the world and this is a more modern map obviously it has the U.S. and North America and South America you, you can see you know Mexico and, and and below this you can see the continent of Africa and and you can see Asia to the east. I mean, you've got you to remember when you're reading the Bible and you're talking about when their region, men came from the east. You're looking at this and you see where east is. You know, east is, they show Iran right there is east. But that gives you a relation when you're reading about these things. You know where our Lord and Savior was born into, the, the area that He was born into. Why would we think, not even created as a country yet, why would we think over here, why would we think He would look like us if He was born into a different ethnic group? in a different spot. Why would we think He would need to? Why would it be important to us that He would look like us? That's not relative really to who He was. So it goes back to what did Jesus really look like? And Frank said it, we don't know. Do you think there's probably a really good reason why we don't know what He looked like? Why there's nothing really preserved and saved? Chris? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He knew that we would do what we've done anyway is create Him in this image that we can be relatable to Him. And we should mold our lives and bend our lives to fit the Scriptures, not worry about like an ethnic group, per se. Um, here are some pictures. I think this is 2011, somewhere right around there where these were taken. But this is in the region where our Lord and Savior was born and where He grew up. This is the actual area where he was at, and these are pictures of native people. You got a couple of men on the right. Looks like they're they've got the pot going. They're about to have some tea there on the on the right. So got some ladies. Look like they're uh, doing something with a tent there on, on the right. This is more than likely similar to what he would have looked like. And the reason I say this, I'm going to read some things to you here. Research on ancient skeletons, and this this goes back to what some of you have already said. Research on ancient skeletons in Palestine suggests that Judeans of the time were biologically closer to Iraqi Jews than any other contemporary population, according to specialists in the field. The average Judean of the time would have likely had brown or black hair, honey or olive brown skin, and brown eyes. Judean men of this time period had an average height of 5 feet 5 inches tall. That was very normal of the culture that Jesus was born into. Why would he have been really different? than that. Their average height is five feet, five inches tall. Um, scholars have also suggested that it's likely that Jesus had short hair and a beard, just like you ask about, because if you look back at the time period you're talking about him born, being born into, the typical Jewish male did not have long hair. So there's all kinds of things that are incorrect about the paintings and the depictions that we see of him, and I think it wasn't saved or preserved because it wouldn't have been a benefit to us because we would have gotten it wrong. We're getting it wrong anyway for the most part. So these are some, some solid facts based on history toward looking at 
the things that we learned. Uh, the earliest depictions of Jesus in the Roman catacombs um, depict Him as free of facial hair when He was younger. So Jesus probably didn't even have a beard when He was younger. It's very likely He did as He got older because that was the culture of what they did, but He more than likely did not have long hair. Now I mentioned the catacombs. Do any of you know what the catacombs are? They're underground burials. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. Let me find my spot here, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the Roman catacombs, the reason they're called Roman catacombs is because they were found around Rome. Uh, you can Google this up and look about it. It's a very interesting read. Let me increase the size of this just a little. I had this pulled up where I could see it a little better. There it is. All right. The Roman catacombs are underground burial places in and around Rome, and they have found at least 40 of these burial places around the Roman city, uh, some only discovered in recent decades. Now, the paintings that I showed you at the beginning of the 4th century and the 6th century B.C., that's where they were found, in the Roman catacombs. Uh, though most famous for the Christian burials, either in separate catacombs or mixed together, Jews also uh, adhere to a variety of pagan Roman religions were buried in the catacombs. So that's a kind of a jumble way to say that you had Christian catacombs, you had Jewish catacombs, and then you had pagan religious catacombs out of the 40 or so that's been found around Rome. And they all had their own way that they would do a burial ritual and different things that they would put in the catacombs. And the reason that I'm reading these things to you and pointing this out is a lot of the things that we found out about Christians and how they lived in that day come from these catacombs. They started using them around the time that Christ was on the earth, but they continue to use them for times past, and that's how you got to have these paintings at the 4th century and 6th century um, time, time frame. Now the catacombs, a lot of them were created, the Romans wouldn't allow you to bury dead bodies inside the city, they didn't allow that. So you had to be outside the city, so during the course of some of the time that they were outside the city, where they got these catacombs from is they had mines, where they would mine stone, they had to have stone to build a lot of the things that they built. So they would have these catacombs and they would dig these dig these mines out and they would get the stone out of it and then they had this hollow hole in the ground and then these people would come along and they would use these and they would seal them up and they would put their dead in it and they would put their uh, precious things like um, uh, statues and things that they would carve and make as well as these paintings that they would put in them. You know, immediately growing up around here, I think about the moisture and the difficulty of that, but we're again not talking about the same region. It's much more dry there, so things would exist much longer underneath there. The, the word catacomb comes from the Latin root word uh, cata, catombus, I don't know if I pronounced that right, meaning among the tombs or according to other, other translations next to the quarry. So see it was at a quarry, a stone quarry where a lot of these were created and where they found them. And there's lots of other stuff to read about the catacombs. The interesting thing to me about that is that those two paintings came out of the catacombs and how they were depicted. And there's been other paintings found uh, depictions of our Lord in there depicted in such a way uh, that shows him without facial hair, like I said. So he lived a very normal Jewish life up until he started his ministry. So we really shouldn't get hung up on the ethnicity of all that. There's one other thing that I want to mention. In Isaiah 52, verse 3, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he's like a root out of a dry ground. And a root out of a dry ground is not too attractive. Yeah. You know? And he was not a comely person. And the depiction of the very modern one that we have, he's a pretty good looking man there, you know. Oh, yeah. So we certainly would see that. And I think that's probably a, was a good thing at the time. They would pay more attention to what he did, the miracles that he performed, and the words that he said instead about his beauty and, and, and his power and all that kind of thing. But they would come to respect that by what he done. It's kind of like the study that we did on Samson that time when we, when we studied Samson in that class. Samson more than likely wasn't the big bulky guy that we thought he was. It was more of a surprise that Samson had the strength he had if he was more of a normal individual. I think that has a lot to do with, with how our Lord came and lived. He wasn't given, uh, his focus was not that he was given a physical presence that made him be that much different. It's who he was and what he could do in that particular presence. So what did Jesus do for a living? He was a carpenter. Do you have any idea what it would be like to be a carpenter during Jesus' time? Have you ever read about that or thought about that? And have you thought about what he would make and what he would do and what he got paid and where he went? 
to do his carpenter work. And why is that important? Well, I'll explain that after we talk about these things here a little bit. And it is important to think about this. You're trying to broaden your thinking about who our Lord was. We tend to look at him as God only, but he came here to be a man, to live as a man on purpose. So I looked up and I got some information on what a carpenter did. And finding information on what the common person busied himself with during this time frame is more difficult than what it might seem. People in history, who did people in history typically write about? The wealthy. The wealthy. The wealthy. They would write about the wealthy. They would write about governors and leaders. Who else would they write about? Artists. 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 They're heroes. People that made an effect, that changed history. That They wouldn't really write about carpenters so much and what carpenters did. They wouldn't write about fishermen so much. We read more in the Bible about all that than a lot of times we do in history of this time period. But uh, we do have some things that we figured out about carpentry and, and some of these works through... Uh, some of the, the secular history that's written, like when they took a census, you would have to go in and you would write down what you did for a living and what you made. So we've got some records of that. And there have been some records exist of a contract between people when they go in and they make a contract. They did that back then too. Like nowadays when you have something done, it's wise to have a contract. We build a house for somebody, we make a contract. Everything spelled out on paper. That way everybody knows what you're doing. Well, they did that back then too. So some of the things that a carpenter would build and... Another thing to note before, this, before I tell you the rest of this, the, uh, the word for, for carpenter, for I said for, for, the word for carpenter in uh, the, the Greek is only one letter off from a person that would be a mason. So there was two different types of carpenters. There was a wood carpenter and there was a masonry carpenter. And Jesus was a wood carpenter because of the way the word is denoted in there, one letter difference. And there's things that they would build. They would build roof structures for houses. I think I've got some pictures here to share with you. Now, the one on the left looks a little too perfect. That depiction looks a little too perfect for me because if you go and you look at the pictures, and I couldn't really find pictures that I liked of actual structures too much, so I chose these ones. So it's, it's really, it's really like almost too perfect for what you see actually built. But this gives you an idea. You see the guy coming in with his donkey. Well, they had a stable down here. They had a wooden gate across that. So they had to have a way to keep them in. So there would be wooden gates to build. You can see these columns here that holds the second floor. They're wood columns. The second floor is wood. The roof is wood, and it's a thatch. And we'll look at that a little bit. You can see the one on the other side is the same way. It's got a thatched roof, and then they would put mud and leaves or grass or straw over top of that to make it more waterproof. They just didn't get as much rain as what we're accustomed to having. Wooden ladders, that's what they would be built out of to get up windows for people that had places and windows. They probably had these, so maybe the kids didn't fall out the window too easily upstairs. So there's wood products to put in these houses. So it wasn't unusual. And this is uh, like, a, like a brick mud structure on the outside of this. That kind of looks like stone in that one, but it was more than likely brick mud that was produced by the masonry carpenters. They would go in and lay a lot of this up, and oftentimes the wood carpenters would travel or go to the places and they would work with them to be able to put a lot of this together. You can see that in these pictures here, it's an underview of a wood thatched uh, roof. You can see the reeds and stuff that were put down on top of the wooden beams and then the, the mud was put on top of it. And then to the right here, you can see there's a table and chairs and bowls and it looks like animal skins, maybe stretched for the seat in the chairs. These are all things that our Lord would have made in the process of doing his, his wood carpentry work that he would do as well as some other things. Uh, let me find where it talks about that. Here's an interesting uh, thing that I just thought of. Joshua was a, Joshua was a mason. Mm -hmm. And I think Brother Don, wasn't he, his name mean Jesus or he was called Jesus? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the same word. Yeah. Yeah, they would, often, <clears throat> they would often work in close relationship with each other. Other things that a wood carpenter would make are uh, oil mills. Do you know what an oil mill would be? They would have a, you can see some depictions of it. Uh, they would have like a wood structure that had a stone, not as big as a big mill stone that would be pulled with mules, but a, a lot of times individuals would have a, an oil mill at their house or in their community, and they would push that, and it was a smaller stone, and they would put the grain down, and it would mash that grain, and they would get the oil from that, and they would use that for their cooking and baking. So that was something that a, that a mason or a contractor, a wood, a wood uh, carpenter would use uh, to make chariot wheels, uh, wagons, barges and boats. 
you know, the boats that we read about and them fishing out of, somebody had to make those and had to hew them out. It would have been a person that did woodwork that would make those. Doors to the houses, often they would make. Uh, they would often work in conjunction with masons to build towers, storage facilities, military defense walls around places that need to be fortified. There would be wood components to that. And then siege machines. What would a siege machine be? I had to look at that a little bit myself. What's a siege machine? It's a funny word. Exactly. Y'all know what a catapult is? Where they would pull the big arm back. A lot of times it was on wheels, so they would make the wheels for it and they'd build the structure and they, they could pull the big arm back and it would have a, a nestled place that they could set a rock in. Or the early bombs that they had, would they would take a, a, a leather pouch and they would fill it with flammable oil and they would light the wick and they would shoot that thing. And then it would land and bust and the fire would spread. So they would make those sometimes. I really don't know that our Lord would build something like that. But... A lot of these other things you have that they would build, and maybe he did. You know, they had to defend themselves against sieges and people coming in to take the land and, and, and fight and, and do those things. So how much would our Lord make? You know, they, like I said, as uh, far as being paid, like I said, they, they have found contracts that were uh, in the census or saved contracts where they uh, made an agreement to produce something. And there was found in particular that I saw, not really a picture of it, but the information from it where a carpenter was contracted to make an oil mill for the house, around 50 denarii a month is what they would wind up making. That's about $2.38 U.S. So that's all relative really to what the economy was back then. That doesn't necessarily make him poor. I think realistically he was probably middle class, very much middle class or lower middle class because that would have been a normal thing that they would have uh, wound up getting paid for that. Let me find this other part that I was wanting to tell you. All right, there, there it is. So the 50 denarii a month in relation to other documents that they found as far as what people got paid, it was much the same as a mason. So a masonry carpenter would make about the same money. It was twice as much as a shepherd would be paid or a water carrier or an unskilled day laborer. So that's why a lot of people think that Jesus was somewhere in the middle class because there was people who had been below, below him and above him. So where would Jesus have learned to be a carpenter from? From his father. Why would he have learned that from Joseph? Because Joseph was a carpenter too. Where does it say that Joseph was a carpenter? We've always thought that and we've always heard that. Does it say that in the Bible? Yeah, Matthew 13 and 55. It's where that talks about that. Matthew 13 and 55. The only reason I ask you that and didn't just tell you because it's important things to know. To know. You know, sometimes we know verses or we assume verses are accurate and then sometimes we find out they're not, but this one actually is. Matthew 13 and 55, that's whenever they, they said, um, you know, is this not the carpenter's son? If, uh, just read that to you. This is where they were discussing what to do with Jesus and the mighty works that he'd done. That's uh, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So they're astonished, kind of like we were talking about. Jesus was a normal citizen. He was a carpenter. He worked with Joseph. They went around and done these projects. He got paid. He had all the same things to deal with that a normal carpenter would. And, and then they're amazed by, they're astonished by the things that he can show them there. And he said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Uh, and he goes on to say, is he not the, the mother, his mother Mary, or called Mary and his brothers? And it goes on and talks about his brothers. So it's a, and another thing to solidify the fact that Jesus was fairly a, per, a pretty normal looking individual, most likely. So here's the biggest reason that I wanted to talk about all this this morning, because we're not talking about a lot of Bible. We're talking about some history type stuff. Here's what I want you to think about. He had work to do while he was here on earth that was secular work. He did it in the environment, whatever that environment was, whether it was hot or cold or wet or raining. He had customers to deal with. He had schedules to keep. His daily life was that of a carpenter for many years before he started his ministry. Now, we know when he was around 12 years old that he started doing some teaching. He went into the synagogue, and he, he, he fell behind. He went in the synagogue, 
and he taught them in the synagogue. So fairly early on, he had that to do. But leading up to when he went all the way into his ministry, he had all these same things that we do. He was tired. He had to sleep. He had aches and pains. Of course, you know, 33 years is the estimated time that he lived here on earth. He probably didn't have that many aches and pains as 33 years old, um, you know, because our, our bodies don't wear down that quickly. He had daily life to deal with just like we do. And I think if we realize that, those things to me make him more relatable to me, looking at what he came here and did for me, than him being depicted as a, a white guy with long hair and a beard that ethnically looks like me. This makes him much more relatable. Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I can relate to that. I'm, I'm just 35. I'm just 35. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point that Don was making that Jesus most likely looked fairly normal in his appearance. That way people wouldn't be drawn to him for the wrong reason. He, you know, you, you see people that are, are very nice looking. They have advantages sometimes that can sometimes become disadvantages as well. Stanley? Yeah, well, if you're talking about history, and these paintings come from history, they don't come from our Lord. That's what I'm saying. It's the yeah. influence of what these people saw as him. If he was a king, then this is what he, they say he had long yeah. hair. That makes and a lot of sense. Yes, and it was like they're putting him as a, uh, at that time, at that time he would be elite. And then if, if you go back in that time, the same people that show uh, Caesars and all this, Yeah. It's just kind of like uh, trying to put him above different being anything going into that, that era. That yeah, a lot, of, a lot of times your Roman leaders, whenever they would go into the Colosseum and they would have the gladiators fight and the wars and different things that they would do or the fights that they would do in the Colosseum, a lot of times the people would wear a wig to that. And they used to denote strength and power with longer hair and facial, uh, facial hair and that type thing. Any more comments? one is Jesus' abilities when he was young. At a young age, he was able to speak to lawyers, doctors, and they were totally amazed at his wisdom. And, uh, and of course, he was, got separated from his parents. But after his parents come back and got him, he stayed subject to his parents until he started his ministry. Yeah, he had that's to a good learn point. a trade as a Jewish boy. Just like Paul did, he was a tent maker, so he learned a, he learned a trade. He was subject to his parents, just like we are, or some of us these days, you know. Uh, yeah. He was a, 
but the thing that he could do would they astonished him with his amazement of his ability to speak. Yeah, his knowledge. They couldn't figure out where that came from. It had to be from God because he didn't get it from being a carpenter. Absolutely. So um, another thing that I want to talk about a little bit, and Jonathan hit on this, and people will tell you in history the fact that Jesus was a carpenter, that he was a lean build, that, that he did that for his work and by the fault that he had to be lean and muscular and fit. And here's why I want to caution you about that. It could have been true. It very well could have been true. And like Jonathan said, you've got to have a certain amount of strength to be able to complete that task. We've got two framing crews that frame our houses. At 55, I don't frame houses anymore. I do light framing and add on stuff and shore up framing and that kind of thing. So I can do it, but as far as building a roof from scratch and stuff, I don't do that anymore. It's uh, physically challenging, and it's a young man's sport, I always say. But we've got two framing crews. We've got, a, we've got an American framing crew, and we've got an Hispanic framing crew. And the description of that, I'm saying American. They're, they're American, Caucasian. They grew up around here. They be, have been here. The Hispanic framing crew, part of them have moved into this country and they, they are legal, you know, make sure of that, and they have insurance, they're all the same. So out of both crews, we've got men on the crew that are fit and wiry and, you know, they look like what you think a carpenter would look like. And then there's the other guys that are kind of chubby or portly or whatever you want to describe them. You think, you know, they're not going to be able to do as much as these other guys. But when break's over or lunch is over, they go right up on that house and they're picking and lifting and doing all the things that the slim guys are doing. So there's some genetics that come into play here. And we see that most people that we know of ethnically, ethnically in Jesus' region were um, slimmer. And, it, and I think it has a lot to do with genetics, a lot to do with how we eat, a lot to do how we approach what we go about doing for a living. Yes, being out in the sun all the time will age you sooner. You know, we make jokes about it, but it is true, it does. And so that could have been some of it. Again, he was only in his, his early 30s when he completed his, his ministry here. But it could have been either way. But I really think he probably was of a slimmer build just because of his ethnic, where he was at, his ethnic heritage, as much as anything. Now, uh, the Hispanic guys sit down and they, they'll fire up a hot plate and they all eat the same thing. But I don't know how they eat when they go home. The American guys all get in their cooler and they eat whatever they bring. And it's, and it's a vast array, like of all of us, healthy, unhealthy, whatever. So I think your lifestyle and how you go about things has a lot to do with that and combined with your work. Uh, obviously, if you're, you're very heavy or you're very small and too weak to do the work, it's going to eliminate you from being able to do that. And then when you get older, a lot of times you become the cut guy on the ground. You're cutting stuff and handing things up to them versus being the one actually on the roof. So it's uh, trying to think outside the box here. Thoughts or comments about that? Thin guys that have got plenty of strength. Yeah. You know, uh, oftentimes they're depicted. Uh, I, I like to watch boxing and all that kind of stuff, and this some of this action stuff, I guess, or whatever. But oftentimes the big guy, he he, he takes a whooping, you know, uh, from the little guy, you know. So yeah. it doesn't always uh, mean that you're a strong as <clears throat> good as thin. You know, whether Jesus was thin or whether he was pretty muscular, but he had to be pretty strong to bear that cross. There's been times on the construction site that I've got a younger guy to help me from one of the other crews, and I'd be standing on the other end of something heavy trying to figure out if he was going to be able to lift it or not. And he's, you know, young enough to be my kid, and he's standing over our struggling here. I'm standing there with it, and I'm not as strong as I used to be. So you really can be fooled by how strong people are. So before we wind up, I'll give you a sneak peek of where we're going with this, and I'll ask you this question, and you can study on this before next week. Why are there no reliefs of Jesus carved into the walls of Citadel discovered somewhere like we saw about Sargon II, or statues or monuments erected of him set in place of Jesus' actual likeness. And it goes along with some of the stuff we've already talked, but we're going to get into the spiritual side of this a little bit more next week. And, and uh, do you remember where this is at? That's exactly right. And a lot of people believe that this is an actual depiction of Christ, but long hair, beard, you know, wearing a robe, same thing that we usually depict him of. But we see of men, we see of men, kings and rulers like Sargon. We saw that. I've, I've shown you those things a few times when we were doing our classes. And they'll depict that, that ruler as close to accurate, as closely to accurate as they can with his facial features and how he looked and how tall he was. And they show him fighting lines and doing all this other stuff. 
Think about that a little bit next week, and then we'll talk about that when we pick up our class. Thank you for your comment.